Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. tuned in to Dr. Judy WTF here at UBN Radio Network. I'm your host, Walt Lusk, and of course, Dr. Judy's in studio as usual. And we are continuing our series on Whole in the Soul series on the effects of narcissistic, no, not narcissistic, we're doing borderlines, borderlines on moms. We did part one last week, and we're going to do part two today. And um, this actually, is the effects of borderline moms on their children. Isn't that what I said? No, you said borderlines on moms. It's the it's opposite. It's, it's, prob- it's how the dyslexic- borderline moms on their children. <laughs> <laughs> how dyslexic of me, but it's probably all one big happy family. But that's because borderline, you know, that particular disorder it has no stability. So don't worry. We're going to be all mixed <laughs> yeah, up on this show it's anyway. It's, all multi-generation- so. it's a multi-generational right. soup. And this is a call-in show. So if you want to get on the couch with Dr. Judy with your emotional ouch, feel free. The number is area code 323-843-2826. We had a great call last week from actually the individual who, sp- who uh, gave us the inspiration for the show. Mm-hmm. She called from Ireland yeah, thank and you was again. up at 4.30 in the morning because that's mm-hmm. what time it was in Ireland. So we really appreciate that. And uh, she has an amazing testimonial and uh, has been totally blessed by our show, which reminds me, I have another testimonial. Oh, yeah. beautiful. This okay. one was quite a pistol, an epistle. But uh, I would like to thank you for the amazing job you are doing out there, helping people bring a very vital knowledge to their lives and sharing your experience. Not taking, not talking about your practice at the Psychological Healing Center, which I am sure gives a lot of people help in real time. I've been thinking about how much other, l- the last couple of decades, The world has changed. How many diseases people have, how many symptoms they experience, and defense mechanisms they use, and most of them do not even know they are injured. I am observing this all around me all the time, and I wish you would have all the energy, motivation, and support to help heal human disconnect in your practice and on the radio, Dr. Judy WTF, which of course is what the Freud so there you go. And she's listened to a bunch of our shows and has been really blessed by it. I so really, thank really you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. And for all the um, the comments that we're getting on our shows, uh, <laughs> we have a, a plethora of comments. Of comments. Um, I want to address some of them. Um, I know we talk in terms of labels, borderline, narcissist, and so on. Uh, this is all predicated on healing human disconnect. So to... Um, remind people a little bit about the system that I use. And for those of you who are new to the show, uh, I would like to introduce you to um, the mind map that I created for healing human disconnect. And I am a systems thinker and I teach my, um, my interns, my psych assistants, how to think in terms of the system, because this is not just like a disorder, borderline, narcissist, depressed, anxious. This is part of a system gone wrong. And we're going to trace the system from the, uh, the inception of the wounds of childhood through how it encodes into our system and breaks us down and how to morph out of this entire psychological prison, as I like to refer to it, or Even more so, I like to refer to it as the double dungeon of darkness because um, when we're injured and we don't have the ability to um, have parents who can nurture us and mirror us and set our thinking straight, we have nobody to turn to and then we turn inward and the inward of a child is not exactly developed because how a child develops is through uh, a mirroring process and a, uh, an emotional feeding process. So when the child is empty and turns inward, um, 
that's pretty sad. And we refer to that as, as the hole in the soul. So, Walt, if you would be so kind as to put the mind map up. I did. And it is, if you're listening to us, uh, you can turn to drjudywtf.com and uh, you can see it there. Thank you. And we also have an app. You can download the app. On your iPhone. Yes, under... Psychological Healing Center. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, the map is uh, divided into three sections. The top, the top third <laughs> is uh, the past. The middle is the chaos of the here and now. And the bottom is what we want people to morph into. So if you look at the top third of the mind map, you will see wound reaction and encoding. And so the wounds of childhood, uh, just very simply put, there are five basic wounds of childhood. Uh, there is physical abuse, there is sexual abuse, there's verbal abuse, and then there's smothering, and then there is neglect. And then uh, there are acts of omission and commission. So to clarify that, what is commission? Commission is what's done to us uh, against our mental health. And, and omission is what's not done for us equally against our mental health. So the omission would be being ignored, for example, and the commission would be being beaten, for example. Okay, so um, unfortunately, most of us do not have white picket fence childhoods. I don't know anybody who's been breastfed and stay-at-home mom, and mom and dad are perfect little people who know how to regulate um, their children's emotions and experience no anxiety, depression, no alcoholism or other substance abuse. Um, you know, we're just not really that clean slated anymore. And uh, this is because we're wounded not only from this generation, we're multi-generationally wounded. And not only are we multi-generationally wounded, we're also culturally wounded. And I've been watching this very carefully amongst my patients who are very multicultural. So I get to observe uh, the different ways in which culturally uh, this, this overlay of wounds affects the individual and the family. So, for example, I, I notice that Persian families tend to smother their children. That is a cultural wound. And so you can see with each particular uh, wounding, there's, there's this backdrop of, 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 of the traditions and the, the norms and the, the rules of the family, and these have to be taken into consideration because uh, as one person said to me today, well, you know, this has been something that goes on generation after generation in my family. And I turned to her and I said, okay, but that doesn't mean it's mo uh, that, that's that's says, mentally that's, healthy. That it's right, right or that it's it's, it's, that's correct. the way it's always been. Well, goodness gracious, it doesn't have to be. Right. So we have to make a distinction be between um, the cultural norms and rules and mental health. And so, number one, we have to uphold mental health. So what does it take to form a healthy human psyche? And I think... John Bowlby, father of attachment theory, Dr. John Bowlby said it best. He said that we need skin contact, eye contact. We need to have a, um, a mother who is going to emotionally regulate us. We need a father who um, nurtures the mother because it's a trickle-down system. So the more the father or the secondary primary caregiver um, supports the primary caregiver, the better the entire system is going to function. So um, that that's pretty much what it takes to form a healthy human psyche on top of it all. Not too much drama, trauma, drug abuse, and, you know, and, and not too much emotional or financial instability. And, and in a big picture sense, we're looking at a pretty balanced family is what take it takes to form a healthy human psyche. Now, uh, we talk a lot about the, uh, the, the narcissistic mother and the borderline mother, and, and I want to make a distinction here because um, the, uh, did you want to say something, Walt? Okay. Fire away, and then I'll uh, Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll fire away here. Uh, okay, so the distinction is that the borderline mother is not good at regulating her own feelings. Her so emotions. she, she, her emotions, so... Her children are used to regulate her emotions. So she's looking 
to her children to center her, to calm her, to be her emotional support system, which, uh, which is obviously not the right direction that the emotions are supposed to flow in. It's and supposed to be the opposite. We have a call. Oh, I was going to elaborate okay, on that. Okay, beautiful, time. beautiful. Just one okay. quick, quick, quick thing I wanted to say. With the, with the narcissistic mother, she needs the child to esteem her and put her up on the pedestal. And hi. Hey, turn your radio down, your computer down, and you are on the couch with Dr. Judy. Thanks for calling. Hi. Um, I'm... Am I on the air? You yeah, you're on the on air. On the couch with Dr. Oh, okay. Judy. Absolutely. Hello, Dr. Judy. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I'm calling. Uh, I know you've been discussing the effects on the children. Yes. Um, I'm an adult child of a borderline narcissistic mother. Okay. Who recently moved back near her family again after living across um, the country from them for a long time. And um, I know the effects, but. How do I cope with it now? Okay, like, so did you say that you're close now in proximity to your mother? Or you're yes, I'm okay. literally, like, presently at this moment in, like, living in the house with her temporarily, only okay. for another week. Couldn't get any closer, huh? Yeah, couldn't get any closer. <laughs> By the way, yeah. where, where are you calling from? Are you calling from local L.A. area, or are you in some I other... was previously in L.A. I'm now in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Okay, so... And then you tried to call last week, and we just didn't have did. time. So okay. much appreciate you calling back. Yes. So, so, um, so, so that's a great question. You know, after all, we, you know, in spite of everything, we still want a parent. A parent is a crucial... <laughs> figure in our life and it's very very painful and sometimes um sometimes you have to cut your parent off but that's just a, on a rare occasion and you know in some cases it's very necessary so i'm not a big fan of complete emotional and uh, physical cut off of a parent unless absolutely necessary because it's too traumatic on everybody so I think what has to be done is that the boundaries have to be set really straight. And especially now because you're in her presence and I'm right. sure she's triggering a lot of emotions in you. And, oh, uh, constantly. But yeah, the constantly. Thing is, I've been trying to draw boundaries for a long time. Okay. Th thankfully, she, growing up, instead of her confronting her issues, she sent me away to boarding schools, to emotional growth schools, to mm -hmm. tons of therapy and some actually pretty unhealthy places that she didn't really understand at the time. Mm -hmm. So as far as, like, therapy and stuff like that, like, I'm much more evolved than her. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. trying to have a conversation about stuff that she just can't confront or deal with is impossible. So, so there's no point. So, okay, so, so here, here, is some, uh, here are some ideas for you. First of all, um, you know, there's a, a phrase in AA that I really like which is you can't share your toys with people who are going to break them. So right. um, in the same vein, you can't share your emotions with people, even if it's a mother or father, with people who are going to use your emotions against you or who right. are going to vampire your own emotions. So um, something I learned in, in psychology school is that you take the conversation away from the personal and you make the conversation about objects and so that kind of neutralizes the conversation so the conversation could be about that very nice movie that you saw the other night or the wonderful lunch that you had together or um, anything but the personal issues because there is a um, there's a desire in us to repair with our parent. The problem is, is that the parent who is the injurer is not really equipped to be the um, the repairer. So we can't expect yeah. them, right? We can't expect them to enter into a reparative conversation, and that's why um, that's why I put together the mind map, and that's why I put together the entire structure so that people can complete on these conversations and actually heal. But don't expect to heal with your mother. She's just not equipped to right. um, She's been doing to, this to her whole it. life. Her and whole she's life. Not her about whole life. Right wounded and mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know, but I go back into, like, being, a, I mean, I'm almost 40, I mean, I'm 37 years old, and, mm -hmm. you know, and I lost my father, passed away, and he was super sick, addict 
total Sorry. alcoholic. Okay. You know, da da took care of him while he was passing away, and then I just had to accept, like, he's never going to change. At least I get to have a few months with him. Mm-hmm. That's that. But mm-hmm. something, like, being in this, like, I've been in their house for three months, and I wow. slipped back into, like, an old, like, wait, you're supposed to be my mom. But yeah, she's got, uh, uh, like, a mommy dearest quality sometimes. She's she's either the hero or the victim at all times, it seems. And, 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 it just, it, and you know, if you could be so kind as since you're experiencing it firsthand, I, I know that the people out there want to know, so what is a borderline narcissistic mom <laughs> like? I mean, what? okay, so what's your experience? So she's a hero one time, wants to be the hero um, some and a victim another? Uh, okay. It's um any conversation... Um, like I've experienced a lot of loss in my life. Like I lost, uh, I, I lost my little sister, which was her daughter as well. Wow. Okay. But also from afterwards, I lost my fiance died mm-hmm. in my arms. My, mm-hmm. my father, who she had divorced millions of years ago, mm-hmm. died in my arms. Mm-hmm. Um, I lost my best friend. Um, so, but I, I'm not allowed to have my own grief mm-hmm. about even my own little sister because mm-hmm. it's only her that hurts. And that's, in any the, situation. and that's the narcissistic part because it becomes only about, about her. her. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, so so basically, you know, there's another grief, too. Uh, and I'm so sorry. You've had so much death and so much yeah, grief. Absolutely. And one thing that maybe you have yet to grieve is the mother that you didn't have. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Because there's a wish that your mother can wrap her arms around you and say, I am so sorry that you've been through this. And, and, yeah. and to be the one that is the, um, the generator of the empathy. And unfortunately, with narcissistically injured mothers, uh, she's not only not the generator, but now you have to turn the whole system around and be the generator of empathy for her, but the problem right. is who gives you empathy, right? Right. And, and so you're running on empty. So what you have to be really careful of is that you have the, the urge, right, to get empathy from yeah. her, but try drawing blood from a stone. It's not going to work, okay? Exactly. Yeah. So, so you have to really, you know, speaking of lowered expectations, you've got to really, really lower your emotional expectations about her and um, understand that she she will try to bleed you out in the sense that she's going to try to use you to emotionally regulate herself. She's going to use yeah. you to esteem herself because if she's got the borderline and the narcissistic features, wow, okay. And so what, what you have to be really, really vigilant of is not to be vampired, right? Right. It's been like... Like, I learned, you know, about, like, being able to parent myself and to take Mm -hmm. care of myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, luckily I found, like, certain friends that have been able to give me some of those, you know, the same nurturing and that kindness and that love. Yes. Like, being in this close proximity that I have been, it's just, you know, no matter, like, I'll I'll restate my boundaries, restate my boundaries, you know. And um, it's just. I mean, I guess, I mean, truly, I know it comes down to, like, acceptance. Like, I just have to accept that this is who she is, yeah, that's how she yeah. is, and it's not going to change. So I need to... Is she you know, is she demeaning, devaluing, and destroying? Does she have those qualities? She definitely has those qualities. She does. Okay, so when she starts in on that, that's where you really have to draw the line and say, Mom, we're not going there. You know, so so the, the, so a solid, just, solid like, boundary. So, it's got to be that solid door, the solid wall that hits her in the face, and it it doesn't even have to have the you word involved because the minute you say you to a narcissistically injured right. person, it's not going to go over well. So you don't use the you word. So you say, "Mom, we are not going there." It's not helpful to this conversation. It's not helpful to the situation. And if she insists, just say, "Mom." Remember, we're not going there. How's your salad? So, yeah. you know, so you have to kind of... Well, that of... would be good if she ate. She's also got extreme eating disorders. Oh, okay. Well, then salad would be the right question, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so... Um, okay. Let, me make you, know, you, let me make you a salad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and just, I mean, yeah. at this point, it's just um, because I slip into that, like, teenage and early 20s, like, anger thing. So I just, yes. like... Because she lashes out, so I just want to lash back out. Okay. But, you know, but she, the way that she takes, like, she can insult me 
and expect me to just be okay and, and go with the flow with it. But if I say uh, the smallest thing sometimes, and mm-hmm. she goes into a whole, you're so critical, you're so hard on me, you know, mm-hmm. I never had anything. You know, it's yeah. very, she, I mean... She, she can dish it out all day long, but you, yeah, she, she can't take it, bow, and then exactly. turns right around and becomes a victim. Right. So, um, so I, I, You're right, I'm just expecting something out of nothing. Like, there's no... The so, not even there, so, so look, one, one of the things that, you know, I, I've been uh, freshening up on my um, theoretical knowledge, and I remember uh, Heinz Kohut and uh, Otto Kernberg um, addressed the topic of borderline personality disorder and narcissism, and they have different methods of dealing with these personality structures. So Kernberg is more confrontative, and Kohut is more nurturing and mirroring. And so the way I like to think of it is I'm really, really soft on the person, if I can be, and I really want to be hard on their pathology. And it, it's important because when you make the therapeutic alliance, or you make an alliance with the person, in, on some level you've got to preserve the person, but you can't really... Um, blow smoke up their pathology either because then that's Mm going to reinforce their pathology. So you can start with the sandwich. Mom, I really get it. It must be really, really hard on you. Mm -hmm. Mom, we're not going into that conversation. It's not productive. Mom, let's do, you know, so it's like the sandwich where you mirror the person and then you set boundaries with the person and then you redirect the person into something positive. So think about that sandwich. Okay, and right. don't, and then when you're full of that aggression, because Kernberg talks about the um, the aggression model, which is they're building it up and building it up, and there's all kinds of stuff that you want to say and do to your mother. And I've heard mm-hmm. some pretty nasty revenge fantasies in the therapy, and we at the Psychological Healing Center are big fans of uh, of, of expression versus repression because it's that repression that causes the uh, the depression actually okay and if it's al- also when it's not expressed it could also be projected onto other people so think about it as right. you know you're loaded with all this emotional distress you don't want to take a swallow and repress it and become depressed you also don't want to project it and you can't, you know, it's like checkmate. You can't talk about it with her. So what are you right. going to do? So that's right. where. That's, that's why I've moved. I literally, the second I could get away, yeah, I, I got away. And the reason why I'm back is because after my sister died, she adopted, who is now my little brother. He's nine years old. Wow. Okay. And so that's, you know, if it weren't like, it's really because of him. When I see like her anxiety and her like complete fits of just, unnecessary rage yes. um, around him is when I just, I can't, I just lose it because it's like such a, I mean, it's such a trigger of my own childhood. And then yep. there's this little person now that I have a chance to be a big sister again. Yep. And I also, I'm just fearful. I just don't want him to like get those feelings that I I also uh, had. I, I and think it's very, my little sister it's, had and it's, yeah, it's it's very it's you know it's really beautiful that you want to protect your, your. He's nine years old. Your brother. He's nine years old. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things you could do to protect your brother, and I know this is really you know walking a fine line here. Um, mm-hmm. Occasionally, you can let him know that he's not crazy and it's not I his do. fault, I do. and that mom is a little you know not really that healthy, and give him a little bit of of a perspective on it. Um, also, I don't know if you have a copy of my book, but I lay it out pretty, uh, pretty exactly in the book going into the wounds of childhood. And then I have a whole chapter on effects of narcissistic parenting on children. And there's a way to explain it to him really simply that, look, you know, what you need to do with mom is you just have to depersonalize it. And it's hard because when you're constantly bombarded by the stuff it's really really hard to have boundaries when are you moving out of there and, and the boundaries is some, i've, I've is got some... one week oh. got it. no matter what like i came days. back here to be near my little brother you know mm. so but okay. for some reason i mean because he's been here since he was two he has a way about him when he's seen her like be you know super insecure and like you know, ranting and raving and kind of anxious and he's super calm sometimes and just walks up and says i love you mom 
you know, like he already knows kind of what she needs. So well, there, that's, cool. mm-hmm. that's really cool to watch. But, yeah. you know, her anxiety a lot when she's screaming, like, let's go, get in the car, we got to go, like all that, you know, and I'm always like, it's okay, you know, yeah, she's it's having a, a freak it's, out, it's, you I'm, know. I'm glad you're moving out, did you say in a week? Yeah, in a week. Okay, so look, you just, you you, you know, you're, you're there on a mission. Your mission is to um, be of a support yeah. to your little brother. You yeah, keep on target, you mind your boundaries, and you don't cut her off. You do that sandwich thing. You mirror her. Right. It must be really, mom, it must be really hard for you to be, you know, um, um, overwhelmed right now. Um, mom, um, you know, we're not going there. She starts demeaning, devaluing, and destroying, and then distract. So try, yeah. try that one. And when it seeps in and starts triggering you, then you've got to back up and just say, wow, yeah. you know, I got I got caught in the dolphin's net on that one and just start right. pulling yourself out. Um, I know, Walt, um, we we have some. Do we have time? How are we doing? Wait, wait, wait the, somebody called, but they, 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 uh, okay, they okay. went away. So. Okay. okay, well, so I will that, get that's... your book, and thank you so very yes, much. The book is My Be the pleasure. Cause, Healing Human yeah. Disconnect, and you can get it on Amazon. Either Thank Kindle you. or paperback. So okay. thanks for calling. Yeah, thank and I know you in some much. respects you feel like you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. But um, you know, hang in there, and um, it, 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 with the fact that you are more aware of what's going on, it, it can get easier. And it's not your fault, right. and no, your mother's it's also, fault. it's, you know, multi-generational. It's not her fault right. either, but, you know, as parents, we have the responsibility to heal ourselves before we become involved in raising children. We just have to do right. that, or we pass the buck to the, the kids, so. Exactly. Okay. I don't want to, I want to break the cycle. For sure. Okay. You're doing fabulous. Yeah. Okay. Thanks well, for calling Well, thank you in. so much, guys. I appreciate God it. God bless. My pleasure. Thanks thank for you. calling. Bye. Okay. And for those of you who are trapped in this horrible uh, double dungeon of darkness, as I want to call it, we have a beautiful staff of people who uh, work uh, with people, teletherapy, Skype therapy, one-on-one for the people who are local to Sherman Oaks, L.A. area. And if you're not local, then we're getting a, a lot of people from literally all over the world, all, all the over world. the country. Yeah. And uh, I, I want to reiterate that the phone and the Skype does not um, interfere with the process <laughs> because we're so focused on getting into the wound and processing the uh, the reactions to the wound and the encodings to the wound. And we have a, a, a beautiful staff of people. All of them have master's degrees. And um, the newer People on staff work on a more sliding scale fee basis. The people who are more experienced obviously have a higher fee. If you want to work with me, it's my pleasure. Uh, reach out. We'll figure out a way to get you from through to and um, I'll, I'll allow you to go through this mind map journey. And um, if, if money's an issue, we really try to work it out so that you can can do this and we really do have a home get, for you yeah and and be yeah. free of this psychological a uh, double dungeon of darkness so it you and know yeah we've got a, another call okay so, great yeah. hi hi you're on the couch of dr judy thanks for calling um yes y'all are doing the get on borderline mothers yes, yes. we sure yes. are hi <laughs> what's your name uh, Susan. Hi, Susan. Okay, Susan. I recognize that I had a borderline mom. Mm-hmm. She's passed away. She passed okay. away in 2004. My problem is my borderline daughter, who is the mother of my granddaughter. I see. Okay. So you have it coming and going. Yeah. Yes. Oh, <laughs> it was like and when my mom passed away, my daughter became just like her. Tough, um, tough shoes she to fill, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. She got pregnant with her first daughter when she was 16, Mm -hmm. and during the pregnancy, she was really, really bad, testing me, and I even had to call the police one time, and all they did was tell me that there was nothing they could do, but if she wanted to move out at 17, she could, Mm -hmm. and if she wanted to move back in, I had to let her, or I would be arrested for child neglect, which really gave her a power trip, Mm -hmm. and I have tried over the years, I mean... She has hit me. I got back from my sister dying. Mm -hmm. Uh, My sister passed away after Mm -hmm. being in the hospital for two weeks. And Mm -hmm. I got back from the funeral. And my daughter comes over. She tells me she hates me. She wished I was dead. Mm -hmm. Hit me with her shoe. And then, you know, I just kept, 
I'd t- I would stand up to her. I would tell her, yeah, I was telling her, get out of my house. Get out of my house right now or I'm going to call the police. Mm-hmm. That's when she hit me with the shoes, I said, get out now. But I didn't have that much strength. My sister had just passed away. Yeah. And um, then she, I found out she was pregnant with her second child. Mm-hmm. And I kept the second child for the first six weeks. I helped her, my daughter, to go to college, I thought. Well, maybe that'll help her feel better about herself. Sure. I know she felt bad about being pregnant, mm-hmm. you know, at such a young age. And um, I thought, if she goes to college, you know, if I help her. So I would get off work and get the children from the daycare if they were sick because she wasn't even allowed to have her phone on. Mm-hmm. She went to, she studied foreign language. So she went to Spain. I kept the kids. Well, I kept the so, one So let, one, me, the let me ask you something. Okay, so is your daughter still living with you? No, she is a um, teacher, and she's living on her own. Okay. The problem is, um, I knew she was still having fits, but she would have them at me, and I was like, okay, okay or so, her boyfriend. So, so look, here's a case where instead of processing her emotions, she is completely emotionally dysregulated. I ha- I'd have to take a complete history to understand uh, what the Freud is going on, basically. Um, and so you probably have, <clears throat> excuse me, more information about whether she was breastfed and stay-at-home mom. And I know dad's um, not in the picture and all was, of that stuff. Yes, um, she was. She was breastfed, but I could only breastfeed her for the first three months because okay. I kept getting a yeast infection and my doctor had me okay. stop long yes, enough to yeah. get touch recycling and I couldn't get it yes. built back yeah, out. So, so, um, uh, but she yeah. was a cranky baby, okay, you know, so look, and she look, bonded look, with dad she's more very, than she did with me. And what happened to dad? What, where did dad go? Dad and I divorced when she was three and a half. And then and did dad for, pay, play a part in her life? Yeah, and for the first year, he took visitation every. There, I have three daughters. Mm-hmm. She's the middle one. Okay. And for the first year, he took visitation every weekend, and then it was I don't know some dramatic thing, and he quit his visitation for a year. Okay, so I want and, you to understand that when children are dysregulated, they have no coping skills, and so they'll either project really hard, and they'll usually project on the safer parent, because if she has dad idealized and dad is only seeing her once a week, um, then she doesn't want to ruin that bond. So who she's probably really angry at also, along with you, is her father for uh, leaving the family. But she doesn't get oh, to... Oh, she s- won't acknowledge that. Exactly. You know, she won't acknowledge it. She's 29 now. Right. She's 29. Okay. And daddy's perfect, but mama... You know, and I've apologized right. over and over again for every little thing I did. And um, now when she was first born, though, they did take her straight from me and put her in an incubator. Okay, for so 24 look, hours. Look, this is all, it's almost classic human disconnect type of symptoms. Incubator babies have really, I have a, 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 a few, quite a few p- uh, patients that are incubator babies. And unfortunately, this type of human disconnect is not helpful in regulating feelings at all. And so because your daughter is so dysregulated, um, having children of her own is putting a, a, a more of a burden on a her. A A huge strain. And she's just not able to cope with any of this. Uh, she has her father idealized and, you know, and, and, and you're the target, unfortunately. Tag your yeah. yeah, tag when your it. So, so here she was 13. I asked her, I said, Why do you nitpick my every word? But you don't do that to your dad. And she, I mean, she's very super, she's very intelligent. She came back a few minutes later and she said, You want to know why I nitpick you and not daddy? And I said, Yeah. And she said, Because I know you love me. Wow, what a great answer. And that is the truth. And as I, as I said earlier, you they are pick the, the safer, safer parent. parent. You are the stable force. Her yep. father's scary because her father left, and so she cannot risk and breaking and any has, more of the she bond. She doesn't want to be abandoned And then he anymore. left again Correct. for yeah. five years when she got pregnant oh, for the first okay. time. So, so one of the conversations, you know, if that'll ever be entered into, and boy, would I love to have her work with with myself or one of the people. I've on staff. mentioned I you to so her, and I it. told her about. 
I've mentioned you to her and I told her about being, you know, being put in an incubator when yeah. she was first born and everything. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if she'll ever call you or not, but the problem mm-hmm. is, um, I found my daughter, my granddaughter, she was 10. She gave me her camera like a year and a half ago okay. to move the videos off of it. So, um, so I did, I put them on my computer because I thought maybe there'd be something on there she'd want to show her kids later, yeah. you know, yeah. her singing or something. And I was going back through it about in May and I come across one and it was really long and I didn't want to delete it in case something was on it. So I was listening to it as I fiddled on my computer Mm -hmm. about 30 minutes in I hear my daughter come in and jump all over the granddaughter calling her lazy and stuff not I didn't you know that didn't bother me as much as when she said she she couldn't get the vacuum to work she thought the granddaughter had busted the vacuum Mm -hmm. she told her daughter I hate you you're the worst effing child that's what your daughter told your granddaughter that's Okay, That's so, what my daughter so, so told look, my granddaughter. Look, I just, I know we only have a few minutes. I just want to address some key points, okay? Number one, you're the safe parent. This is multi-generational, so you can I'm all... not safe anymore. She's not talking to me because I went to the youngest therapist thinking that maybe they could help with this. And it turns out they're just giving my youngest granddaughter ADHD medicine. All I'm they so do is sorry. check her height. That, and that's her typical her because they don't want to deal with it. Because there's so much, you know, if you look at what's really going on, there's so much anger, unprocessed anger. So when she gets angry at you, one of the things you could do, I know this doesn't sound, uh, you know, like you know, the nicest thing in the world to do, but just, you know, so, sometimes you just have to sit and say, you know, I'm just going to listen to how you feel and let her go on and on and on and on and on and don't defend. And if she starts hitting you, then it's boundary time, right? And just let her go on and on and on. And then um, one of the things you could say is, look, you know, I'm, uh, you know, thanks for sharing it. It's not pretty stuff. And then just let her get it out because all of this is poison and she has to keep shoving it back inside of herself and she really needs treatment. And so one innocuous thing you could do is get her the book. I have it on Kindle version two. See if she'll even read it. See if she'll even go to the website and look at the mind map. She even told me she thought she might be borderline. And I just looked at her like, do you think? Well, I didn't dare say anything because anything I say, she automatically comes back on. Okay, look, people do things for their own reason. They don't do things because you tell them to, especially daughters and sons. They don't listen to their mothers. They'll do, they'll do for themselves when they're in trouble. They'll do for themselves when their lives aren't working. And sometimes they have to hit a pretty hard bottom. So I think in, in your case... Well, I think that hard bottom's getting ready to come because she, wouldn't let, she won't let me see the grandchildren and I'm concerned about them because she has hit them. She has smacked the oldest, and she holds the youngest down and holds her hands away from her ears so that well, she they, can't cover her really, ears with mommy. They really need you, and all you can do is be there for the grandchildren. They will seek you well, out Well, I they can't can. be there right yet, right. but I am taking my daughter to court for grandparents' visitation because Good. I'm like a psychological parent. I have been there all through their lives, picking them up every weekend practically, you know, getting them from school, watching them while she goes out of the country for foreign study well, well look look it may well be that's a good boundary that, that you know you may be the more competent parent and the kids may be better off with you than their own mother and so you may want to go for grandparent right psych- psychological eval and uh, also there's child protective services there so you know it's such a sad story i'm, I'm so sorry that the, the yeah my attorney is asking is going a court this. ordered psychiatrist um, psychologist be yeah, there and, and plus it, there be a guardian ad litem. You know, the, the legal, where are you from, by the way? South, South Carolina. Carolina. South Carolina. Look, the legal system doesn't always uh, uh, serve the public, not always. So, you know, understand that. I think, you know, in the big picture way, your your grandchildren, even when, you know, they're 18 or whatever, they will seek you out because you're the balanced parent. I know we have to That's go. That's what I told them. I told them to find so, me. My two yeah, other daughters right. aren't speaking to me because of this. Okay, just wait. I know this is a waiting game. Wait and you be the grandmother that they call and say, Grandma, I'm so happy. I'm 18 now. I get to do whatever I want. So just be very, very patient and try to hang in there and mitigate the damages, okay? 
my hope is that when, you know, even if this doesn't work out, even if I don't get the visitation, they will know somebody fought for them. For sure. And that hopefully for they will 100%. fight for themselves It'll when they're older. Right. It'll right. come back, we promise. Yes. Yes. They won't, you know, get in, go looking for love in all the wrong places. And yeah. All the and, other things kids and, and, get into. And, and you will be their stability. So It'll uh, be their rock. Just, you, you know, take yeah, care of Yeah, I told him, yourself. I said, if mommy ever stops me from seeing you... Then you, I, you find me. I'll be on Facebook. That's you right. You find me. That's right. So okay. So look. Um, thank you very much Thanks for, for sharing. It's so part. painful. And be sure and, to get the book. It's, it'll help out even if it is. Because I haven't around. just lost one daughter. I've lost all three because so I refused to back down on the court. Okay. So so sorry to hear this. I, and I, the other, the other two, they heard the video. They, I mean, I turned it into an audio and sent it to them. They heard it. And it's like they don't even pay a bit of attention to that. They just keep talking about the daughter, not the grandkids. And I keep bringing it back to the granddaughters. And yeah. they keep bringing well, it back. Yeah, you one can't of, one of the fight things, that hard. No, yeah. and one of the things a borderline does is they do not take responsibility for their actions. Oh, it's just not in the DNA. Yeah, that's one of the, one of the uh, signs of And that's of what I'm borderline. hoping that maybe this court thing will make her take responsibility. Well, sometimes you know? they hit the wall really hard and they end up in the hands of the law so we're hoping that she bottoms out really quickly be there for i don't want to i don't so, want to hurt my daughter i no, love her I very know, much I but i can't let her hurt my grandbaby for like sure this. not they they have to be protected so they do because they have no say they have no choice they yep. don't have any right childhood is a hostage, hostage situation, situation as we like to say and i had a friend of mine say that sometimes children can be paras para parasites yeah, in this case, they, they need, well, in this case, they need you, Grandma, so take good care of yourself, and when they're old enough, they will find you, Facebook, however, they will, and just be healthy, and uh, you're their rock. When so. I, when they would come with me before they got taken away, I would tell them, forgive your mom. She hurts really bad inside. Okay. Don't, you know, try to, try to just forgive her, she, you know, and I tell them she was wrong in what you know, they tell me she said that and they need they feelings. need to hear that because then they they're gonna think that they're they're to blame. So anyway, yeah, I thought please... I said it's no, it's not you. She didn't have a right to say that or do that. Correct. But you need to forgive her for Correct. yourself. So we got to okay, go. So, so yes. thank you so much for calling and um, keep listening and uh, call back another time. Yeah, thank you very much right. for calling in and let us know how your family is doing. Okay. Okay. Take okay. care. Thank God you. Bless. Okay. Bye -bye. Take care. I just, with the few minutes we have left, and it's mm -hmm. just a couple, I just want to touch on real quick because we've got a, a couple of calls with some amazing examples of yeah. lines. But yeah. one of them is they are addicted to drama. And we just had a phone call with a lot of drama. Yeah. They're just a magnet for drama mm -hmm. because the burden of how and they're feeling is very overwhelming. Emotional dysregulation. So it's not yes. like they're wanting to be drama queens. It's just that they cannot find their compass point mm -hmm. inside, and this is what it looks like. They have problems of intense, uh, they have a pattern of intense and unstable relationships, and we've heard that part. Mm -hmm. We talked about all the way they refuse to take responsibility for their actions. Mm -hmm. uh, they have very impulsive and high-risk behaviors, as we've talked about. And lastly, they just, sometimes it's so overwhelming, they feel suicidal. Yeah. So, right. A lot um, of acting it's out behavior. A lot of acting out, and right. it's no picnic at all. No. A lot of them are high-functioning, and it's very complicated to diagnose. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so a couple of calls. That's great. Well, we're yeah. going to end it on a, maybe a high note. Of those of you that are new to the show, we have a segment that we're going to do called Shrink That Tune, where I, we take a popular song, and this one is uh, by request. We're going to do Green Day. We've, one of my favorite bands. One of Dr. Judy's favorite bands, and we've one shrunk of them, one yeah. of them before. And this one's entitled Boulevard of Broken Dreams. And I'm going to read the lyrics, and away we go. I walk a lonely road, the only one I have ever known. Don't know where it goes, but it's home to me, and I walk alone. So this is very um, much of a metaphor for the inner world of the borderline. There's a sense of aloneness, a, a sense of emptiness, because they haven't really internalized a good, stable object, meaning they haven't taken in mother in a good, solid, stable way. So they have a very, very 
um, big sense of emptiness, that hole in the soul. So they're, they're on a lonely road in life, and they're walking alone. Well, they're also walking on this empty street on the boulevard of broken dreams where the city sleeps and I'm the only one and I walk alone. And I think the broken dreams is the the fantasy of having stability and a, an intact family and the, the, the dream is a, a good enough mother, a good enough father and this has been broken. And the city sleeps, to me that means that nobody is really there for them, whether mm -hmm. it's their aunt or uncle or cousin or friend. There's just like everybody's out of it. Nobody's there. Well, it, it, The whole it, community no, is I just agree. out he's of it. He's walking alone at night in the city sleeping, and they don't even help him during the day, and yeah. so he's, he's alone walking at night. Yeah. My shadow is the only one that walks beside me. I think that's just an incredible line. Yeah. My shadow, the only one that walks beside me. My shadow's heart the only thing that's beating. Sometimes I wish someone out there would find me. Then, till then, I walk alone. So my shadow's the only one that walks beside me. There's that d desire for mirroring because that's what borderline personality disorder is, is a lack of mirror. So all she or he has is the shadow to really stand beside him or her. My shallow heart's the only thing that's beating. So... Um, again, there's no inner core, the, even the heart, you know, even the heart is shallow. There's that hole in the soul. And there's this wish that someone will connect, you know, the speaking yes, of healing human disconnect, that they find absolutely. that person. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's that sense that, that until that yeah. person comes into their life, there's, they're walking alone. Yeah, that one person that connects with them and gets them. Right. I'm walking down the line that divides me somewhere in my mind, on the borderline. On the edge and where I walk alone, read between the lines of what's messed up and everything's all right. Check my vital signs. I know I'm still alive and I walk alone. Wow, I'm walking down the line that divides me somewhere in my mind. So that's the splitting because one of the me defense mechanisms of the borderline is the over evaluation and devaluation of self and others mm -hmm. and so on the, they're always on the edge because one minute they love you and the next, next minute, minute they, they you know don't. i love you i love you i hate you i think we have an episode yes we that's do titled something mm -hmm. like that and it's it's just i hate you really, i hate you don't leave me don't leave me thank you <laughs> so you know they're always on the edge yeah and so they want you to get them. Read between the lines. Please understand me. They mm -hmm. want to be gotten, and everything's effed up. And 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 they want you to you know like check on them once in a while. Check my vital signs to know yeah, I'm still check alive. My poles. Yeah, like yeah. I don't really want to be alone. Come, mm -hmm. don't let me die emotionally. In all ways, don't let me die. My shadow's the only one that walks beside me. My shallow heart's the only thing that's beating. Sometimes I wish someone out there would find me. Till then, I walk alone. I walk this empty street on the boulevard of broken dreams where the city sleeps, and I'm the only one, and I walk alone. Yeah, it's just such a description of that lonely, empty, hole-in-the-soul feeling. That's why I just love love the song and especially i love it for the topic that we're on yes because it's so uh reflective of that lack of mirroring and the you know the the loneliness the boulevard of broken dreams and that is the boulevard of broken dreams mm -hmm. by green day and you've been listening to dr judy wtf and you know what more of you are writing to info at dr judy wtf and we read everything that comes in. If you have an idea for a show, like those of you in Ireland, give us a, okay. let us know. We'd love to do that. We picked this one up actually on a comment from YouTube. And you can find us, of course, on YouTube, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and iTunes. And, of course, on the uh, app on your iPhone, Psychological Healing Center. And your conversations are really much appreciated. Absolutely. They we certainly are. And sometimes we miss some responses, but we, you know, we're going to try to respond as much as them. possible. Yep, you bet. So thanks for listening. We're going to close out with our song. Again, this is Dr. GWTF, What the Freud, here every Thursday at UBN Radio. And uh, until next time, God bless. <laughs>